Well, hello, Scam Nation. Don't know if you saw it, but we just shared over on the Modern Rogue channel my entire fire eating routine and one of the best versions of it we've ever put together. The footage is gorgeous, well worth watching, but I figured you guys would like to know how do you write a routine like that? It's a pretty good fire eating routine. It won awards. I've done it for literally millions of people on television. And if you want to know how to write your even better version of it, I'm going to tell you the whole story about it after we watch it. Art over which oblivion threatens to stretch her darkening wings. Howdy folks, my name is Brian Brushwood and I spent 20 years touring all over the United States and internationally with a bizarre magic show. I also literally wrote the book on fire eating. Oftentimes I would do shows and a lot of those audiences were not there to see me. I had to figure out really fast how to get their attention, and I figured out the secret was to begin by just lighting a torch, twirl it, and I would say, shh, and I would begin by telling them the history of fire eating. The concept of resistance to fire is one as old as history itself. As far back as the ancient Greek tragedy Medea, references were made to holding a bar of red hot iron in one's hands in order to prove innocence or sincerity. A practice co-opted by the Romans and used for 2,000 years. The first written account of a fire eater, however, occurs in 1633, when a man named Sir Henry Wotton wrote of an English sailor who upon returning from the East Indies could eat fire as though it were candy. With that in mind, I want to demonstrate for you the simplest method to extinguish a torch with one's mouth. Thank you. I can't hear your applause, but I know all of you are very excited about that. <laughs> Actually, it is more impressive. It looks more like this. Here we go. There we go. Now the first commercially successful fire eating act went on tour during the 1660s. It was performed by a French man known only by the name of Richardson, who was renowned not only for his ability to swallow flame, but for his apparent affinity for it. It was rumored that his teeth and gums were so calloused and immune to heat and flame, he could actually hold a burning torch between them, just like so. At which point, and this is totally true, people would spontaneously post his routine to Reddit. It was amazing. There we go. Woo! <laughs> now by the 1800s, we come to a time that some people call the golden age of fire eaters. This is a time when performers with names like Yamadeva, Ching Ling Fu, or Xavier Chabert, the Fire King, these individuals shifted the focus of fire eating away from the tolerance of the heat and the flame, and instead moved it towards the artistry and the skill with which one manipulated them. Here's the hardest move in the whole show. There we go. Now by the 1920s, we come to a time where fire eating took a nosedive. In fact, Harry Houdini, of all people, called fire eating an art over which oblivion threatens to stretch her darkening wings. This is a time when fire eaters were kicked out of the theaters, now into the streets, where in order to draw bigger crowds, they began performing increasingly dangerous stunts like the tongue transfer. perhaps eating twice the flame at once. It's a lot of fire. <laughs> All right, here we go. Whoa, oh boy. Oh. 
Woo! And finally, I'd like to conclude this demonstration by showing you the single most difficult and dangerous fire eating stunt. This one's called the human candle. Now this is usually the point where I ask the audience, do you want to see more? Which point I can't hear you guys. I'm going to assume you're all posting nice things in the comments. And that's when I'd say, well, you know, I wrote a book on fire eating and when I did, I discovered a combination of feats that's become my favorite thing to show people. Check this out. Go! <laughs> now at this point, hopefully, we've captured the attention of everyone in the room and they want to see the rest of the magic show. If you are in that camp, the whole show is over at scamnation.com. Head on over there. But if you're somebody who just wants to know how to do all the fire eating stuff, guess what? I'm going to be teaching Jason Murphy right here on The Modern Rogue and you need the manual. I wrote the book on fire eating. It's normally $40 for 48 hours. We're giving it away free. Just head on over to gimme.scamstuff.com. Sign up, get it totally free in digital format. Hope you guys dug it, man. This is going to be a fun series of videos. You're going to dig all of this. Also, why, why is there so much water in here? Is there, is there a leak? Is that what... Uh, so, I mean, it looks cool. I'm not going to deny that. I'm, I'm just not in, where am I walking? It's not like there's even an exit here. I just hope that you'll cut at some point. We're going to break down not only how I wrote this routine, but how you guys can do the same thing for yourself, whether it's with cards, with coins, with whatever kind of magic you have to work with. Also, that free giveaway of the $40 book, technically that's over for that video, but we'll start another one right now. So head on over to gimme.scamstuff.com and we'll learn how to write award-winning routines. Worked. Attention, Scam School fans of Earth Dimension EE 275. This is Brian Brushwood from Earth Dimension C-137. We've recently been taken over by the Galactic Federation. I never got a television show. I never changed my hairstyle. And in this dimension, I grew a sweet, sweet soul patch. Also, I like wine. I've seen things you wouldn't believe. Scam Kata on the shoulder of Orion. Card tricks at the Handlebar Bar. Wait, you probably have seen that one. It's too late for us, but not for you. You could get the word out. You could make a website using your friends at domain.com. They don't exist in my dimension. That's why we fell. You can use promo code SCAMSCHOOL at checkout to get 15% off your order. You'll be keeping Scam School C-137 in business and the better version of Brian alive. Got nothing to live for anymore. I'm gonna set everything to overdrive. I'm gonna self-destruct. I'm gonna eat sunflower seeds whole. What's the point? So one of my favorite people that I ever had the opportunity to teach how to eat fire is an author by the name of Patrick Rothfuss. He wrote a book, The Name of the Wind. It's gonna be a huge movie and TV show at some point, I'm certain. But in that book, he describes the job of a wizard or magician in real magic terms as part of the process being to break your mind into two pieces that hold different conflicting stories at the same time. This is the key to writing good magic. Part of your brain is busy with the job of telling one story to the audience through all of your nonverbal communication, through the manipulation of objects, your body posture, everything that at an animalistic level tells one story, while meanwhile the language part of your brain is telling a totally different story. A good variety performance, whether it's magic, juggling, acrobatics, is often telling two stories 
stories at the same time. So you have to engage in a process that TV writers call breaking a story. Step one is grab a bunch of post-it notes or index cards and write down a bunch of things that you can do that you think may or may not belong in this routine. These are a bunch of things that as a viewer, you get a little serotonin rush when you see it. For example, I might write on a card, lighting a torch and saying nothing, spinning a torch, uh, tossing a flame from one to another, blowing out a torch as a fake. I would just write down the words fake out. I might write lighting a cotton ball on fire. And then you could get wacky, right? Uh, leave the stage, start yelling, remain silent. All of these little things that will pique people's interest. Now you don't need to know the order that any of them are gonna appear in. You just need to know all the things you could do. If you were creating a card routine, you might start with all of the flourishes that you know how to do. Different ways to shuffle, uh, red cards mixed with black and then they separate or something like that. Once you have all of these beats, now your job is to arrange them in a way that they get progressively more interesting as things go forward. In the case of the fire eating routine, we start with a torch being lit, spun around, no talking, you have a stark visual, you wait until everybody gets uncomfortable, you build to a crescendo, and you get that release of energy with the torch being blown out. After that, everything is pretty much a linear progression of what I perceive to be increasingly more impressive effects from beginning to end. Now, along the way, there were times that I would reach forward and pluck out a cotton ball and toss it into my mouth. There was a time that I ended the routine with a giant fire blast. Eventually, those got cut because you'll refine the story later. But the important thing is to have multiple elements. You don't wanna go 15 to 30 seconds without some kind of aha moment from the audience. Again, if this was a card routine, maybe it would begin with a story about the deck of cards and it would maybe have a couple of flourishes, spinning a card, tossing a card, a flashy shuffle or something like that. And it would progress into more and more interesting esoteric types of shuffling. But here's the problem. At this point, all you have is a bunch of set pieces. Think of this as a movie. You have set pieces that are all individually cool but they're also all devoid of context. This is the hard part. This is where you have to construct a narrative to bring all of these beats together. Now, part of that means you are going to cut some of these beats, but if you have a good story, that doesn't even matter. So at this point, you have all these note cards in order of the beats that you want to do, and you know you're gonna cut some of them, but you also have a reserve of things you can add. For example, recurring joke, a weird, funny, magical phrase to call back. Now comes the hard part. You have to pick your story, your narrative. Your narrative must be so interesting that even if there was no magic, people would be happy for the story. Now, in my case, with this fire eating routine, I didn't even know that I wanted it to be the history of fire eating. I just thought, well, I'm sure there's a story somewhere. Maybe I'll read some stuff about fire eating and see what I find out. So I read Houdini's Miracle Mongers and Their Methods. All of that history that I tell, that's all in the first few chapters of that book. And as I was reading it, I realized, wait a minute, why am I using this for inspiration? This is the story. This is fascinating. I mean, think about it. This is a story so good that absent of magic, Houdini was able to put it in a book and here I am a hundred years later reading it. So in my case, I settled on a narrative about the history of fire eating. Now, in the case of your imaginary card routine, it could be the story of a love that was lost, a family member who got lost and came back, the imaginary story of the time you went slumming with somebody in Boca Raton, Florida. It doesn't matter as long as it's a good story. And all of the best stories are based on stuff that that actually means something to you. You have good stories. You tell them all the time. Just figure out which ones you like the most and how you want to blend it with the beats you have laid out in front of you. So in this case, we have the story of fire eating, kind of a historical progression. We have all of these beats, but the problem is very clearly, the older the text is about fire eaters, the more outlandish and crazy the claimed stunts are. Everything from being baked in an oven at a thousand degrees to, to drinking, burning gasoline or whatever, stuff that didn't happen. So I can't tell that part of the story and also have it map with the progression that I've laid out. So now comes the massaging and you can tweak each of these aspects. You have beats that you can either add or take away, but you also have a story that can be massaged to fit what's happening. So I begin by speaking in vague terms. The concept of resistance to fire is one as old as history itself. Sure, tracks. Meanwhile, the other part of your brain is saying, that is fire spinning, that is pretty. And I'm putting it on my arm. These are, these are kind of 
tier one effects that I'm doing in this first part. And then putting it out of my hand, as I say, a practice co-opted by the Romans and used for over 2,000 years. So far, so good, right? Again, still factually accurate, I say, but the first written account of a fire eater is blah, blah, blah. And we build up to that moment. And when you feel that tension build, that's when I move that beat card, the one that says blow out the torch and set it down to break that tension. Part of that is so I make sure that I'm not asking too much of my audience too early. Once I've done that, you get this release of laughter, then you actually perform the first bit of fire eating. Now to make this fit with the story, I just leave out giant chunks of the story. If you read that book, there's all kinds of outlandish things in there, I just don't mention those. I say, here's the first written account of a fire eater, I ate fire, next phase. Then we get to the part where I talk about the first commercially successful fire eater, the first guy to go on tour. This is again, a progression in the story, but also a progression to a more impressive beat. In this case, holding the torch between my teeth. And I had to do a little bit of juggling here because the actual text talked about how Richardson would grab red hot coals and toss them into his mouth. And originally I would use that beat to pull out the cotton ball and toss it in my mouth and then hold it between my teeth. All of this factually accurate, matching the story. Also, you don't have to be factually accurate. You're in showbiz, for crying out loud. But I noticed that that was slowing down the rhythm, so eventually that got cut, and we just shortened it to, again, factually accurate. He could hold burning torches between his teeth, just like so, boom. The third section, when we talk about the manipulation of fire, this is the most technically difficult part, so I sort of run a medley. I mention a bunch of different names. Again, the language part of your brain is saying like, oh, these are crazy names of fire eaters. And you'll notice one line where I say, now by the 1800s, we come to a time that some people call the golden age of fire eaters, which is factually true because that's what I've decided to call it, starting the day I wrote this routine. But it's an opportunity for me to do this quick medley while conveying that this was sort of a heyday, which again is factually true, give or take. Now at this point, per the story, this is where Houdini kind of wraps it up because he's coming to current day, a time when vaudeville is on its way out. And he sort of just says, eh, you know, what can you say? Variety arts are on their way out. An art over which oblivion threatens to stretch her darkening wings. At which point I have to invent another beat with one of the most impressive feats of the entire thing, holding the flame with the human candle. And again, this is all just massaging. You want to preserve the integrity of the story, not the specifics of it. Likewise, nothing is sacred in the beat side of things. You should be able to add and remove for timing and for the maximum response. And if you've done it right, when you put it all together, you get a narrative that is fully self-contained that speaks at two different levels to two different parts of your brain. And hopefully you guys can go out and win awards and then send me a check. Uh, yeah, just 25 cents for every show you do. That's all I ask. That should be enough to keep this crazy cult running. All right, for all the hardcores, you know that we are creeping up on 1,000 videos. Now that you know the secret of deconstructing story and pulling out the beats, you could take all of the stuff you've learned so far, break out the key elements, and write your own story. Speaking of which, I want you to send me your ideas. I want you to send me your half-baked routines. Let me review them right here and give you advice so we could be a proper scam nation together. Scamnationshow at gmail.com. Send in your half-baked routines.